Hi, thanks for joining me. I'm Carla with Rice Walk, and today I'm going to be sharing with you my Amazon bestseller book haul. But before we get started, a little bit about this channel. Here we share good thoughts about good words, and on Fridays I host a live Bible study on Instagram at Rice to Walk. And then I post two videos a week. One of those is at Bible study, and then the other one is a video about books. So if you are interested in any, either of those things, be sure to like and subscribe so you can get updates about new notifications. So here's the deal. I've been doing reviews, just some things I like, and I've noticed that I read a lot of things that maybe not everybody does. And I thought maybe I should read some things that other people like and see what I think about those. So I decided to do um, buy some books off of the Amazon bestseller list. This has been a few weeks ago that I bought them. The bestseller li list looks a lot different now, but at the time, the number one bestseller was the new Hunger Games book, uh, is it Snakes and Songbirds or something like that? And the thing is, I did not get that one just because I haven't read any of the books. I think I've watched most of the movie movies, but I thought, you know, I don't want to have my first read be something, you know, right in the middle of it. I did not read any of the descriptions of these. I just bought the books. Uh, now, go, looking back, I found I did watch a video by Julie Autumn Books, and she said, watching her videos, I just discovered that that was a prequel. So I probably could have gotten that one and not been thrown out of order. Um, but I just saw one of Christie's reviews, and she wasn't really that much of a fan of it. So whatever. I didn't get it anyway, regardless. But that one was number one at the time. So these other five were all within the top ten. There were some of them that were like kids' books, and I so anyway. So... I bought these five books, and we're going to see my thoughts on things that everybody likes. Because a lot of times, things that everybody loves, I can't stand. Like, for example, Wuthering Heights, horrible, and Guardians of the Galaxy. That was a horrible movie. I actually bought it before I even watched it. Huge mistake. I will never do that again. That was a horrible movie. The only good thing about that was the soundtrack. But anyway, so I'm not necessarily expecting that I like all these just because a lot of times I don't like things that everybody else does. You can go and I did a video on five favorite love stories that I hate. That's kind of an example of that. But anyway, the first one I bought was Untamed by Glennon Doyle. I actually thought this was a novel. It's not at all. It's a, um, a memoir. And uh, I'm just going to read the beginning of it. There is a voice longing inside you to each of us. We strive so might mightily to be good. Good partners, daughters, mothers, employees, and friends. We hope all this striving will make us feel alive. Instead, it leaves us feeling weary, stuck, overwhelmed, and underwhelmed. We look at our lives and wonder, wasn't it all supposed to be more beautiful than this? We quickly silence that question, telling ourselves to be grateful, hiding our discontent, even from ourselves. For many years, Glennon Doyle denied her own discontent. Then, while speaking at a conference, she looked at the woman across the room and fell instantly in love. Three words flooded her mind. There she is. At first, Glennon assumed these words came to her from on high. But she soon realized they had come to her from within. This was her own voice, the one she had buried beneath decades of, of numbing addictions, cultural conditioning, and institutional allegiances. This was a voice of a girl that she had been before the world told her who to be. Glennon decided to quit abandoning herself and to instead abandon the world's expectations of her. She quit being good so she could be free. She quit pleasing and started living. Soulful and uproarious, forceful and tender, Untamed is both an intimate memoir and galvanizing wake of call. It is a story of how one woman learned that a responsible mother is not one who slowly dies for her children, but one who shows them how to fully live. It is a story of navigating divorce, forming a new blended family, and discovering that the brokenness or the wholeness of a family depends not on its structure, but on each member's ability to bring her full self to the table. And it is a story of how each of us can begin to trust ourselves enough to set boundaries, make peace with our bodies, honor our anger and heartbreak, and unleash our truest, wildest instincts so that we can become women who can finally look at ourselves and say, there she is. And Untamed shows us how to be brave, as Clinton insists, the braver we are, the luckier we get. So just reading that, um, this is actually in the Christian, it was under Christian category. Uh, my thoughts on this, just from reading the excerpt, is that this is probably about as Christian as Rachel Hollis's Girl Wash Your Face. If you don't know what publishers do, they basically will put um, they put books in a category, basically the game the bestseller category, and, and that's my opinion about what this is. Just from the overview, there's nothing Christian about that outlook. It's a very self-focused, self-centered sort of ideology. But I'll read it. I'll see what my thoughts are on that. 
Okay, the next book I, I got was um, Body Keep Score. Very different book. And this is by Vessel Van, Van der Kolk, MD. Uh, this subtitle is Brain, Mind, and Body in the Healing of Trauma. This is, um, I haven't read it yet, but let me, let me just read the expert. Okay. A pioneering, a pioneering researcher transforms our understanding of trauma and offers a bold new paradigm for healing. Trauma is a fact of life. Veterans and their families deal with the painful aftermath of combat. One in five Americans has been molested. One in four grew up with alcoholics. One in three couples have engaged in physical violence. Dr. Bessel van der Kolk, one of the world's foremost experts on trauma, has spent over three decades working with survivors in the Body Keeps Score. He uses recent scientific advances to show how trauma literally reshapes both body and brain, compromising sufferers' capacities for pleasure, engagement, and self-control and trust. He explores innovative treatments from neurofeedback and meditation to sports, drama, and yoga that offer new paths to recovery by activating the brain's natural ne neuroplasticity. Based on Dr. Van der Kolk's own research and that of other leading specialists, the Body Keep Score exposes the tremendous power of our relationships both to hurt and to heal and offers new hope for reclaiming lives. Uh, this is, I have not read this yet, but it's really, um, uh, it has like a lot of pictures in it. It has, I don't know if you can see this, but um, it has more um, technical descriptions this book, I actually, I was talking to my friend Charlotte Thomason, and she has a book that is coming out about, you know, recovering from trauma, and um, it's, it's a memoir, basically. And we were looking at other books that were kind of similar to hers. This is basically, we were having a discussion about marketing, and, and when I was researching it, this book came up, and I said, well, you know, I can't remember what she said about this one, but this is, it sounds really, really interesting to me. I actually volunteered in a prayer ministry that focused on praying for healing a few years, several years ago. And one of the things that we were taught in that, um, in that, in the training for that, that ministry is that a lot of times, um, about six to 18 months before the onset of chronic illness, there'll, there'll be something that happens like a traumatic, a, a traumatic thing. And so this, this chronic illness is really kind of an outworking of that, that emotional trauma. Um, what we found is that I have, I have not read this book, so I don't, I don't know what, what his solution is, but what we found and what we saw was that when you, a lot of times, like when someone would come in, you would, you know, and you're always praying and asking the Holy Spirit to you know, be working in this situation. But most of the time they, that person could identify what that, what that situation was. And the key to that was forgiveness. You know, sometimes it's forgiving yourself. Sometimes it's forgiving another person. Sometimes it's for, for, forgiving God. But the, the key was to, you know, lay down the cross and to, um, to forgive and to, you know, ask for God's forgiveness for holding on to that forgiveness and resentment. So anyway, so it'd be interesting to read this to see like what his, what his thoughts about the whole thing are. Okay. So the, the next book I got was Little Fires Everywhere, a novel by Celeste Ning. And, uh, this is, I think this is actual fiction. Um, and the, on the blurb, it says in Shaker Heights, Heights, a placid pro progressive suburb of Cleveland, everything is planned from the layout of the winding roads to the colors of the houses, to the successful lives its residents will go on to lead. And no one embodies the spirit more than Elena Richardson, whose guiding principle is playing by the rules. Enter Mia Warren, an ignat enigmatic artist and single mother who arrives in this idyllic bubble with her teenage daughter, Pearl, and a disregard for the status quo that threatens to upend this carefully ordered community. Suspicious of Mia and her motives, Elena is determined to uncover the secrets in Mia's past, but her obsession will come at an unexpected and devastating cost. Little Fires Everywhere explores, explores the weights of secret to the nature of art and identity, the ferocious pull of motherhood, and the danger of believing that following the rules can advert disaster. Okay, so uh, this was actually, I guess this is a Hulu original series starring Reese Witherspoon and Kerry Washington. And this is like Reese's book club. I did not know. And so is this one. I did not know that Reese Witherspoon had a book club. Hopefully she's better at picking books than she is movie scripts. Need I mention hot pursuits? Just saying. Anyway, so that was number three. Um, so the fourth book I bought was The Silent Patient by Alex Michaelis. Okay, let's see what this one is about. Okay, Alicia Berenson's life is seemingly perfect. A famous painter married to an in-demand fashion photographer. 
She lives in a grand house overlooking a park in one of London's most desirable areas. One evening, her husband Gabriel returns home late from work, and Alicia shoots him five times in the face and then never speaks another word. Alicia's refusal to talk or give any kind of explanation turns a domestic tragedy into something far grander, a, mis a mystery that captures the public imagination and casts Alicia into notoriety. The price of her art skyrockets, and she, and, this, and she, the silent patient, is hidden away from the tabloids and spotlight at the Grove, a secure psychiatric unit in North London. Criminal psychotherapist Theo Faber is captivated by Alicia's story and jumps at the opportunity to work with her. His determination to get her to talk and unravel the mystery of why she shot her husband takes him down a path more unexpected, more terrifying than he ever imagined, a search for the truth that threatens to consume him. Shocking, thought-provoking, and deeply twisted, The Silent Patient is a spellbinding psych psychological thriller about violence, obsession, and the dark side of passion. Okay. That was number four. Okay, the fifth book that I bought was It Bleeds by Stephen King. Um, I, again, I did not read this at all. For some reason, I thought this was a book on writing. I don't know why. Anyway, okay, so this is the blurb on this. In January of 2021, a small padded envelope addressed to Detective Anderson is delivered to the Conrads, the Anderson's next-door neighbor. The Anderson family is on an extended vacation in the Bahamas. Printed on this envelope in large letters is do not forward hold for arrival. When Ralph opens the package, he finds a flash drive titled, If It Bleeds, presumably referring to the old news trope, which proclaims, If It Bleeds, It Leads. The drive holds a kind of report, a spoken word diary from Holly Gibney, with whom the detective shared a case that began in Oklahoma and ended in a Texas cave. It was a case that changed Ralph Anderson's perception of reality forever. The final words of Holly's audio report are from an entry dated December 19th, 2020. She sounds out of breath. I've done the best I can, Ralph, but it may not be enough. In spite of all my planning, there's a chance I won't come out of this alive. If I do die, you can continue what I've started. Please be careful. You have a wife and son. Okay. Um, so this is actually short stories. Let me read the blurb. Readers adore Stephen King's novels and his short stories are their own dark treat, briefer but just as impactful and enduring as his longer fiction. Different Seasons, the knockout King collection featuring Rita Hayworth and Shawshank Redemption and The Body, made into movies, um, was published nearly 40 years ago. The stories and their characters seem as fresh today as they did when King first introduced them to the world. In If It Bleeds, King gives readers four brilliant new stories, sure to prove as iconic as her predecessors. Once again, King's remarkable range is on full display. In the title story, readers' favorite, Holly Gibney, must face her fears and possibly another outsider, this time on her own. In Mr. Harrigan's phone, an intergenerational friendship has a disturbing afterlife. The life of Chuck explores beautifully how each of us contains multitudes, and in wrath, a struggling writer must contend with the darker side of ambition. If these stories show King's range, they also prove that certain themes endure. One of King's great concerns is evil. And in If It Bleeds, there's plenty of it. Imagine in the story, in the title story, as a big bird, all frowsy and frosty gray, there is also evil's opposite, in which King's fiction often manifests as friendship. In this collection, Holly is reminded that friendship is not only life-affirming, but can be life-saving. Young Craig befriends Mr. Harrigan, and the sweetness of this connection is its own reward. King also reminds us that life quotidian pleasures are even more glorious because they are fleeting. The outrageous good fortune of a beautiful blue day after a string of gray ones. The delight of, a, of dancing really well, when every move feels perfect. A serendipitous meeting. It's in these moments that King's ability to describe pure joy rivals his ability to terrify us. This is actually out of all of the books that I bought. I think this is the one I'm most excited to read. I, I did watch a review of one of the short stories on Codex Cantina, and they were um, they were giving the similarities between um, I can't even remember which story it was, but that and that Ambrose Bierce's The Occurrence at Elk Creek Bridge. Let me know if you've read any of these books and which one you think I should read first, but. Anyway, thanks for joining me. If you haven't already, be sure to like and subscribe, and I will see you next time.